Who is your enemy? Is it a rival nation state like Russia? Is it a politician and their followers across the political aisle? Is it a bully at school? Maybe a brother or a sister who you hold in murderous contempt? Perhaps one you share wedding rings with who has repeatedly wounded you with a thousand small knives. Who is your enemy? And have you loved them? Let us kneel and confess our sins to God. Merciful Father, we now confess that we have sinned in rebellion against you and your way. In what we have thought and imagined, in what we have said, or in how we have said it, and in what we have done and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, as you have asked. And we have not loved our neighbors, let alone our enemies, as we love ourselves. Lord, we are sorry, and we repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us our sins, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, rise and hear the good news as proclaimed in Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Share a sign of peace with one another.
we were crushed by our sins and ravaged by guilt. We raised idols we could not feed, but you freed us from bondage and showed us the way. Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray together before you go downstairs. Is there anything that I can pray for for you? Yeah, thank you. You're so cute. We can pray for that grief. Rain, tell me what you want me to pray for. Your mom? Okay. Anybody else have a joy or a concern that I can pray for? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you meet us here, grown-ups and kids alike. Jesus, I pray that you would minister to these kids in their memories, that we pray for mommies to need help and healing as they have asked. And we pray for all of us that we would be able to give and receive your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand up and face the congregation. And I'm going to remind you what we say. We say, may the Lord be with you. And let's just say it as loud as we can, okay? So make an eye hug with somebody that you know. Ready? One, two, three. May the Lord be with you. Good morning. My name is Goody Bell, and I'm one of the pastors here at Blacknell. It's my privilege to welcome you all, longtime friends, first time visitors, and anyone in between. I got a call from Dave on Thursday saying, I'm sick. Can you preach? And first of all, I want to say, it's that germ season again. So please feel free to wear a mask or to distance if that makes you more comfortable. And know that during cold and flu and COVID season, 
we will all need to be more flexible. We'll be asking for more last minute volunteers. So it will present an exciting challenge for us as well. So pray for Dave as he mends at home. He longs to be with you this morning. I also want to say that this occasion of Dave's illness reminded me how grateful I am to be a part of a community of people who are ready and eager to step in and help lead worship, uh, like Wynn and Kat and Ava. One of the things that we do as a staff is we talk about our upcoming Sunday sermon text during our staff meeting, or sometimes it gets pushed to staff lunch. And this week we started supper in small groups where many groups of you are getting together to talk about the upcoming Sunday's sermon text. So it was actually, when I got the call from Dave, it wasn't, oh gosh, no one's been thinking or talking to me about this scripture passage, but I was actually able to say, oh wow, I've already been talking about this with my brothers and sisters in Christ. We've already been chewing on this word together and so I can bring forth the reflections of our community on Sunday morning. So this is one of the things we want to be, is a community who is chewing on the word together throughout the week. And then someone comes on Sunday showing the fruit of our collective chewing. Does that make sense? So our text this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5. We're finally at the end of this chapter. We'll begin with verse 43. Let's listen again to the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's football season. Yesterday, my family took in some of the Ole Miss and Alabama game and a little bit of the Notre Dame-Ohio State game. And as the season goes on, the matchups will become more consequential and the rivalries will be on display. Perhaps no rivalry is more famed than the rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State. Their matchup each year is called the game. And with this rivalry, as with other sports rivalries, there are some odd rituals and traditions. For a few years there, the governor of Ohio banned the state from using the letter M for Michigan on game day. No one in the whole state of Ohio was supposed to use the letter M in any correspondence. It had to be crossed out on the day that Ohio State played Michigan. It's said that the players of Michigan are banned from wearing the color red ever, and that a former coach would actually rip off their shirt if they were wearing red, and that nowadays things have toned down and he'll just snip off your tie if you're wearing a red tie. To have a rival, someone to root against, it's engrossing, it's fun. So fun that sometimes you forget why you are actually a fan of your own team. What better way to show your love and loyalty for Duke than to root against UNC in the tournament? What better way to show your love and loyalty for UNC than to hate Duke? But in our text this morning, Jesus calls his followers to a radical new way of showing love and loyalty to him. Our text today wraps up this section of the Sermon on the Mount. 
For the last few weeks, our sermon texts have adhered to a formula I hope you've noticed. Each week, Jesus begins, you have heard it said, and he quotes some portion of the Old Testament law. Then he continues, but I tell you, and then Jesus offers his own interpretation of the aforementioned law. In this chapter, Jesus has addressed some pretty challenging topics, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and now enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Earlier, we read the command to love your neighbor from Leviticus 19. This chapter of Leviticus and the book of Leviticus as a whole shows a lot of concern for how the Israelites are to live together as the people of God and to maintain peaceful relationships with one another. But you'll notice that we did not read in the Old Testament a command to hate your enemy, because there isn't one. God never provides his people a license to hate, not in the Old Testament and not in the New. Yes, God does express his anger against the enemies of his people. And yes, in the context of holy war in the Old Testament, sometimes the Lord instructs Israel to put their adversaries to death. But nowhere does God enshrine the rule that Israel should love their neighbor and hate everyone else. Yet Jesus, and those people who were gathered around listening to them had a lot of enemies, or would be enemies. First of all, perhaps you would say Rome. As Jews, they were living under occupation on their ancestral land, and Rome, the pagan nation who ruled them, imposed harsh laws and taxes. Their second would-be enemy were the uh, their second would-be enemy were the wealthy Israelite collaborators, like tax collectors, who benefited from the oppression of their people. The third would-be enemy of Jesus and his listeners were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who opposed Jesus' ministry. And to add to all this complication, there were zealot groups who advocated for violent revolt, and there were separatist groups who called for strict separation and spiritual renewal. And either of these groups at various points might view Jesus and his followers as sympathetic to their cause or opposed to them. So Jesus and his followers would have had no trouble imagining who might be their enemies. Now, each of these groups and other varieties of thought that existed at the time had different ideas about how God would one day deal with Israel's enemies. Some advocated peace and tolerance now. Some even envisioned non-Jews as a part of God's kingdom one day. But it's not hard to imagine that there were other Jewish teachers who emphasized love for Jewish neighbors and allowed for hate. This is what Jesus is responding to. But it's not just Israel, of course, that Jesus is addressing, nor simply Israel's prejudices that Jesus has in view. The human heart loves having someone to hate. Psychologists call it in-group favoritism and out-group bias. People are prone to favor those who are like them and prone to misjudge or mistrust those who are not. Whatever you call it, you have seen it and you've been a part of it. Kids, you see it at the lunch table and on the playground. Grownups, you see it in politics and racism and in unresolved family disputes. You know that this goes much deeper than sports. And it turns out that an enemy is a powerful thing. Enemies turn out voters. 
Enemies justify wars. Enemies underwrite our grasp for power and our need for control. Enemies explain why we lock the car doors when we drive through certain neighborhoods or why we need to increase our military spending budget. Perhaps most seductively, enemies define who is in and who is out. And you prove your loyalty to the in-group by showing your disdain for those on the outside. You can claim that you are really one of us if you share our struggle and adopt our contempt for those we hate. This is the classic strategy of the bully who pressures his lackeys to pick on the outsider or else be on the outs themselves. Ercole Visconti is the memorable bully from the 2021 animated movie Luca. Luca and his friend Alberto show up in a small Italian town in, we'll say, an unusual circumstance. But when the two new guys arrive, they have the misfortune to knock over Ercole's shiny new red Vespa. And Ercole does not miss an opportunity to inform these newcomers of his position as the local boss. He tries to intimidate them, and a young girl, Julia, zips by on her bike and overhears the confrontation. Now this is the moment when Julia can either ingratiate herself with Ercole by playing along, rid ridiculing the boys herself, or she can consign herself to the outgroup by taking on their cause. Julia offers the boys a ride away on the, her bike while the rest of the kids look on silently. And Ericole writes her off along with them, calling out after them, go start the club for losers. There's many a club that is based on common rejection or shared hate. Many a club that's based on common rejection or shared hate. Many a group that begins with a greater purpose devolves into this. What does it mean to be a Duke fan but to hate UNC? What does it mean to be a conservative but to hate liberals? What does it mean to be a Democrat but to look down on Republicans? What does it mean to be American but to resent outsiders? What does it mean to be a Christian but? Jesus says no. No, not in my kingdom. Jesus does not want us to hate those who hate him, but instead to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us, that we may be children of our Father in heaven. The way that you display your likeness to the heavenly Father is different. The way that you show you belong to the kingdom is not the same. The way that you roll with my squad and belong to my people is something new. It's not shared hatred, but wholesale, unbounded love. Love that mimics the love of God himself. And to illustrate the love of God, Jesus appeals to creation. God causes his son to rise on the evil and good, Jesus says, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Through the goodness of the world that God made, God gives generously to all people, irregardless of their loyalty to or love for him. Every morning, the light of the sun dawns on those who disdain God, who ridicule him, who work against his ways. The rain falls and waters the fields of the murderer, the adulterer, the liar, and the heathen, even as they wash over the crops of the saints. Jesus names the good and the evil, the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus does not say that all people are good, but Jesus says that God pours out his gifts even on those who are bad. 
if we only love people who love us back, we are more like the tax collectors than like God, who gives to those who do not respond at all. If we only greet our own people or acknowledge those who are already accountable or beholden to us, we are more like the pagans than like our Heavenly Father, who gives to those who do not acknowledge or even thank him. Be perfect, Jesus concludes, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is calling his disciples to go a step further than what he commended in our last text. They are to go beyond non-retaliation to a love that is mature and complete. This is the meaning of what it means to be perfect, not to be flawless or impeccable, but to be fully grown and mature, to offer yourself and your gifts not only to your friends, but even to your enemies. And it's in Jesus that we see again that this is the hallmark of the Heavenly Father, a heart that doesn't hate, but a heart that loves to love. In Christ, God identifies himself with the world that has rebelled against God. God joins the people who dissed and dismissed him. And in Christ, we all, Jews and Gentiles alike, did it again. We could not stand God's presence among us. We could not tolerate God with us. And so we rejected God by the most humiliating and shameful means possible, the cross. But in his great mercy, in God's mind-blowing generosity, God turns even this, our rejection of him, into a gift for us. For as when read earlier, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So even our disobedience and rebellion, God turns into our blessing. Though we wound his flesh and grieve his spirit, though we wish God dead and kill him, God returns to life and promises to bring us unloving, ungrateful, unrighteous souls to life with him. Through Christ, God does what God's law intended to do, to train a bitter and wayward people in the ways of love. The same God who makes the sun to rise each morning and showers rain upon the unrighteous, broke bread with his betrayer, and prayed for the forgiveness of those who put him to death. He not only calls, but also empowers his people to do the same, to forgive and to give generously to the undeserving. What does it mean for us to extend this unbounded love to those who resist, reject, and even oppose us in our daily lives right now? What does it mean for you as kids and as adults? Sadly, we followers of Jesus have often missed this command, and instead we have retreated to the old ways of showing love and loyalty. It is a disturbing reality that so many Christians try to prove their love for Christ by hating his enemies. We prefer to hate those who hate Jesus instead of loving those who persecute us. For so much of its history, the church has been zealous to persecute by all the means within its power and not to pray for those who reject Jesus. 
But today, friends, we are confronted with Jesus' radical call once again. Can we hear it? In the bitter cold of winter, 1569, a man made a daring escape from prison. He fled across a frozen pond and a guard pursued him on the ice. As the guard followed, the ice capsized beneath him, plunging him into the icy waters. The fugitive heard the guard's calls for help, and he turned around and saved him, resting the man from a watery grave at the price of his own rearrest and execution. The man was Dirk Willems, a Dutch Anabaptist Christian, and his story is contained in a collection of tales about those who were martyred under the persecution of their fellow Christians, Protestant and Catholic. Centuries later, in our own time and place, we, the church, are heirs to both the peril, heirs to both the peril and possibility of this tale. Will we, the church, stalk down those who oppose us until we hold them captive and silence them? Or can we, the church, reach out our hand into the icy waters and take the hand of those who threaten us, entrusting our own survival to God, the one who reached out and took hold of us even when we were enemies? Let's pray together. Lord, you reach out your hand to us all day. You open your arms to us on the cross, bidding us to receive your love. Lord, pry open our hard hearts. Release our tense and bitter backs. Straighten our necks. Pick up our heads that we might see those before us and extend your love to them. By the power of the Holy Spirit that raised you from the dead, give us love we do not have for each other, and for our enemies. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise in body and spirit.
was on the night that he was betrayed by one of his own, that Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he said to those around the table with him, who but hours later would deny him, betray him, and abandon him, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. For you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. It's a covenant poured out in his blood. All of you, drink it. Friends, Christ our Lord invites us to this table. Would you rise and sing and pray with me? follow him. If you know that you need the Lord to nurture your faith, come forward with your hands outstretched, receive a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and partake before returning to your seat. If you've not made a profession of faith, we invite you, please come forward, but do so with your arms crossed, and we'd like to give you a short blessing. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come.
Jesus. Lord, we thank you for once again feeding us on this, your body and blood. We thank you for once again forgiving us and for once again giving us your spirit through which the life of the risen Lord might be at work in us. We give you now these tithes and offerings as but a token of our gratitude and pray that you would use them for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may proceed. Thank you, Van. Good morning. I'm Kat Burgett, the Director of Youth Ministry here at Blacknall. Uh, Becky Gould is away this weekend, so I have the delight of sharing with you what's going on in our life together. So, of course, the first announcement will be about the youth. Uh, today, during youth group, which starts at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a simultaneous parent gathering in the choir room. I'll share more about what's going on with the Blacknell Youth Ministry this year, and Susan and Warren Kinghorn will then facilitate a conversation around raising teenagers. Uh, I don't know why it's, said. it's a great thing, great conversation to have. Um, the deadline to register for the men's retreat is coming up soon, and I believe there's somewhere a man who's going to tell us more about that. I'll up here. Man, Thank you, Jeff. October 27th to 29th, um, it's going to be in Montreal. Lee Anderson, part of the Meat Squad, is going to be doing the music, and his dad, Phil Anderson, is going to be our speaker this year. On behalf of the team of men who've been planning this weekend, we really want to connect with you there. And if you're the kind of man who likes to wait for the last minute, keep all your options open, well, this is the last minute. This is the last Sunday to sign up. Uh, we have to send our numbers into Montreal this week, so please go to the website, sign up. We don't want money to be an obstacle. Scholarships are available. Uh, so if you are at all inclined, I encourage you to sign up. All right, thanks, Jeff. So today is the last Sunday to sign up for the men's retreat. You can do that online. Scholarships are available. Uh, Supper in small groups continues this week on Wednesday. Supper will run from 5.30 to 7. You can drop in anytime you'd like. I believe the menu this week is a pasta bar. Uh, if you didn't come last week, you can still come this week and enjoy. Uh, finally, a week from today, on October 1st, we're going to be starting a new evening prayer service that will run monthly. At this service, we'll worship God through music, prayer, and communion, but the service will also look a little different than a Sunday morning. It'll be quieter and more contemplative, and it will be centered specifically on our longings and prayers for healing and wholeness. The evening prayer service will begin at 7 o'clock. Anyone is welcome to join, and I'll expend, extend a special invitation to youth and their families who will be around anyway for youth group. And we hope you'll consider inviting a friend, coworker, or family member. And I think Chris Blumhofer might have more to say about this. Yeah, I just want to uh, extend a personal invitation as someone who's been involved in the planning of the service. Uh, I know from my own life that opportunities to slow down 
and come before God in prayer and worship are just not common enough. And so as we try to incorporate something like that into our life together, I encourage you to, uh, to come. Thanks, thanks for it. Thank thanks, you. Chris. Are there any other announcements? All right. We want to be in prayer this week for Josh and Lori Riggs uh, on the death of Josh's father on Wednesday. We also want to celebrate with grandparents Dave and Kim Dunderdale on the birth of Clement Dunderdale Lowe, who was born to Nellie and Sam Lowe this week. Are there other things we can be praying for? Our, oh, yes. Thanks, Carolyn. Pray for Roy. Good, good. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, giver of every good and perfect gift, your creation bears witness to your power and your care. We thank you for the sea and the land, the day and the night, the sun and the rain. We are not worthy to receive you or to receive your gifts, but you lavish them upon us with a single word. You are our good and gracious Father. You love us abundantly, even when we forget you, ignore you, or persecute you. And so as your children, we approach your throne of grace with confidence so we may find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We pray for those who are sick, for Don, Rick, John, Roy, Dave, and others we name silently before you now. We pray for those who mourn, for Josh and Lori and others on our hearts. Draw near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. We pray for those who rejoice, for Dave, Kim, Nellie, and Sam at the birth of Clement, for others we think of now. Show them that you share in their delight and shield them in their joy. We pray for those who work on our behalf, for Becky Gould and the members of the Building and Property Committee as they oversee work on the nursery and youth room, for the members of the Children's Ministry Director Search Committee, for the members of the PNC. Give them perseverance, wisdom, and hope, and prepare our hearts to receive those you will send us. And in response to your recklessly generous love for us, we pray for enemies, our own and others, we pray for legislators in Washington to work together, even with those they despise, to resolve the government shutdown crisis. We pray for nations at war, that you would bring peace and reconciliation. We pray for those who persecute Christians around the world, that you would open their eyes and call them to repentance. We pray for our personal enemies, for all those who have hurt us taken advantage of us, slandered us, and cast us aside. And when we can't pray for them, when our hearts are too fragile and wounded to extend our own grace, pray on our behalf, Lord Jesus. We entrust ourselves and our enemies to your justice and your grace. Keep teaching us to pray, as you taught us once before. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. We have one more item of business this morning. We have the joy of receiving folks as new members. So if you are planning to be received as a new member this morning, please come forward and sit in the front row. 
Many of these individuals are folks that you have been worshiping alongside for months or maybe years. Um, they have completed the new members class either, either over five weeks during the fall or over a weekend this spring. And they, along with others who will join at the 11 o'clock service, have discerned a desire to publicly join with this congregation so that together we might follow Christ. If you're interested in membership, we, uh, we will do another new members weekend in April. So you may talk to me or Dave or Becky when they're here. So let me uh, stand and introduce you. So Wynne Reagan is familiar to you as our director of worship here at Blacknell. Luke Newton might be known to some of you from his work down on the elementary hallway this past year. Jimmy and Mary Lynn Myers and their three girls, Lila, Kitty, and Adele, have been worshiping with us with, for some time. Gurney Buchanan is often found with the young adults or back in the sound booth. And Jeff and Libby Coles have joined us with their three children, Camille, Danny, and Simone, just over a year ago. We're so delighted to have you among us. Now would you turn and face me? Please respond, I do. Do you accept the gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ as revealed in the holy scriptures of the Old and New Testament as the way to eternal life? Do you? Do you acknowledge that you are a sinner, sinful by nature, but that by the grace of God alone your sins have been forgiven and your old nature put to death? so that you may be brought to newness of life and set apart as a member of the body of Christ, do you? Do you promise to pray for yourself and for others, seeking God's guidance as together we seek to grow in knowledge and understanding of the faith, do you? Do you promise to show in your own person the joy of new life in Christ by active participation in the life of the church, and by faithful attendance to worship, service, and the offering of prayers and gifts to the glory of God, do you? Do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church, obeying its doctrines and its teaching, and do you promise to walk in the spirit of Christian love with the congregation, seeking the things that make for unity, purity, and peace? Let me invite the congregation to stand. This is a reminder for all of us who have publicly joined as members of the vows that we have made. And so let me ask you, the members of this congregation, do you welcome these brothers and sisters into the community of faith as communicant members? And do you pledge to them your love, your prayers, and your encouragement as they live the Christian life with us? Do you? Please say, we do. Let me pray for you all. Lord, we praise you for the brothers and sisters in Christ that stand before us, for the testimonies of your faithfulness, of your forgiveness that they bring to us, and for the gifts that you have given them. By the power of your spirit, give them the strength to fulfill their vows and lead us as together we seek to follow you. We ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen. And let me ask you guys to remain up front so that you all may come and greet them. But receive now the benediction. We've gathered to remember God in Christ who loved us, who reached out to us even when we were his enemies. And we send you out in his name to love and to serve him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Mighty God, we thank and praise you for this meal, this bread of life, precious blood.
Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.